Good afternoon and welcome to the latest webinar, which is the one I'll be doing with Pierre Georget from Goldsmith Chambers. Uh, it's going to be on immigration bail and unlawful detention claims. Uh, I shall start, um, I'll say a few words about Pierre, and then I shall start in relation to general principles concerning immigration detention powers and their use. Uh, and then uh, Pierre will focus primar primarily on the issues of bail, uh, and then we will be happy to take your questions afterwards. So a word or two about Pierre, first of all. Um, as many of you will know already, he has an extremely busy immigration practice. Uh, he's, uh, he is very junior, but he's got a really a wonderful practice, specialising in judicial review. His particular interest lies in British nationality law, and, and he has a number of reported cases in that field, which you will find on his website. Uh, he's also many, many times instructed in other areas of work, mainly related to the immigration system, for example, appeals against employer penalty notices in the county court and various unlawful uh, detention claims uh, in, in civil law. Uh, and uh, also it's very useful, when it, does, it does a very useful work in relation to costs. Um, and of course, he has lots of hands-on experience in the first tier tribunal bail hearings, which is why he's going to talk in that area and applications also in the high court. Uh, and uh, in the course of his words, and we are conscious of that, the shortness of time, uh, he will seek to give some practical advice in relation to applications for bail. Um, so uh, now we'll start. So the first area we'll be looking at is, is general principles in immigration detention powers and their use. Uh, and this section is identifying statutory powers, looking briefly at available statistics, both before the pandemic uh, and since uh, lockdown at the end of March. So we start, first of all, with the powers of immigration detention, statutory powers, uh, and they come under the Immigration Act 1971, as I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know already. Um, they come under the area of Schedule 2, pending removal, and also Section 62 of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002. So the power to detain an illegal immigrant or a person liable to administrative removal or someone suspected to be such a person uh, is set out in paragraph 16, subsection two of schedule two to the Immigration Act 1971, as applied by section 10, subsection seven of the 1999 Immigration and Asylum Act. Paragraph 16, two states, if there are reasonable grounds for suspecting the person is someone in respect of which, of whom directions may be given under any of the paragraphs eight to 10 or 12 to 14, that person may be detained, and I stress those words, under the authority of an immigration officer pending either a decision whether or not to give such directions or b his removal in pursuance of such directions. Section 62, which we also mention, introduced a freestanding power by the Secretary of State, an official acting under that person, uh, under the Secretary on his behalf, his or her behalf, to authorise detention in cases where the Secretary of State as the power to set removal directions. And then we have Schedule 3, pending deportation, uh, and also Section 36 of the UK's Border Act 2007, which provides a power to detain a person who is subject to deportation action as set out in paragraph two of Schedule 3 to the 1971 Immigration Act, and Section 36 as set out of the 2007 Borders Act, which is automatic deportation. This includes those whose deportation has been recommended by a court pending the making of a deportation order, those who have been served with a notice of intention to deport pending the making of a deportation order, and those who are being considered for e automatic deportation or those pending the making of such a deportation order as required by the automatic deportation provisions, and also those who are subject of a deportation order pending removal. These powers, it's important to note, are framed for speci the specific purpose of removal or deportation, which means they can only be used for that purpose. And that idea forms the basis of, of what I'm sure you all know, is the well-known Hardy or Singh principles governing when detention becomes unlawful. Use of detention powers pre-COVID-19. I'm going to show you some statistics for 2017. As you can see, 27,331 people entered detention, 28,244 left detention, 13,173 re returned from the UK, 
and 12,321 is the total number of enforced returns from the UK, of which 5,835 were FNOs. So, over half of those detained were released. Interestingly, in 2018, 55% were detained who were detained were subsequently granted bail, and detention was ineffective in over half of those cases. So what do those immigration statistics tell us? People leaving detention by reason. So you can see there in that table from the years 2010 through to 2017. And you can note that roughly 30,000 people are detained roughly every year, of which a decreasing number are actually then removed or deported. As you can see, total detainees around that 30,000 mark. Uh, and then you can see uh, how many are returned from the UK, going from 16, 17,000 down to about 13,000 in 2017. Let's compare immigration statistics for the top five nationalities in 2017. And you can see there Pakistan being the highest, Albania, India, Romania, and Bangladesh forming the other top five. Uh, and the likelihood of removal is much higher for European cases than, for example, uh, in these countries, Pakistan, India, Bang Bangladesh in particular. And also note this includes voluntary departees, departures. Also note that unlike much of Europe, there is no legal limit, time limit on immigration detention. There's an ongoing political debate on this issue. And in 2018, around a third of detainees being released had been held for over 28 days. Of these, 15% had been held for over two months and 5% for over six months. So let's look at the situation under COVID-19 in terms of the use of detention powers during the pandemic. Well, importantly, we note a reduction in numbers, but no plans for wholesale syst uh, systematic release. On the 1st of January of this year, 1532 people were detained. And on the 21st of April 2020, so that's about, about a month after lockdown, 708 people have been detained. And of those 708, all but 21 are FNOs. Pe the people detained, therefore, has been almost exactly uh, halved. So, in fact, it's estimated that roughly another 200 have since been relieved, uh, re released. So we're really down to about 500 still detained. Um, and there were amongst, amongst informal uh, reports of lack of testing and lack of PPE. COVID-19 removals during the pandemics. As at the end of March, so that's at the time once lockdown uh, had, had been introduced here, returns were, uh, had been suspended to 49 countries. In late April, the Home Office confirmed that there's no general policy to suspend removals. The Home Office referred to a flight to Poland and removal directions to other countries have been set since March. And we understand the BBC reporting that 50 people have been returned during the pandemic. Uh, COVID-19, Home Office specific measures during the pandemic. Um, both ILCs and prisons have been closed to visits. There are plans for isolating people at risk in the ILCs, along with guidance and cleaning materials given to detainees. Guidance on, the ha on handling symptomatic people in, in the centres, people from countries to which removal is not possible to be released unless they pose a high risk of harm, and there's a short period to review all cases. These were the measures which persuaded um, in the detention action case in late March, uh, the High Court not to order release. It's unclear about the position now in particular individual cases. So what are the legal safeguards against detention? So I'm going to identify the legal protections and the constraints on the statutory powers. The legal safeguards against detention are Article 5 of the European Convention, the right to liberty, including a speedy resolution, resolution before a judge. Articles 2 and 3 of the Convention, basic standards of treatment for people detained. Article 8, the decision to detain must be proportionate uh, in relation to the right to private life in such rights are engaged. Judicial review, powers to detain can only lawfully be exercised. This is the case 
uh, that I've mentioned already, where there's a prospect of removal within a reasonable period, known as the Hardeel Singh principles uh, and immigration bail. So on the question of law lawful detention, the general principles, which came from Hardeel Singh uh, by Mr. Justice Wolf, as he then was, uh, and were then uh, affirmed uh, significantly in the Supreme Court by Lord Dyson in Lumba, the four, uh, the four principles are, the Secretary of State must intend to deport or remove the person, can only use the power to detain for that person. The deportee may only be detained for a period that is reasonable in all the circumstances, if before the expiry of the reasonable period, it becomes apparent that the Secretary of State will not be able to effect deportation or removal within that reasonable period, he should not seek to exercise the power of detention. And fourthly, the Secretary of State should act with reasonable diligence and expedition to effect removal. So um, you can see that uh, the Secretary of State has to act to make decisions in accordance with applicable policy unless there is a good reason. Uh, and whilst a grace period is permitted where removal cannot be in practice effected, for example, to arrange appropriate bail conditions, that can only last for a reasonable period of time, which generally would be regarded as a matter of weeks only. And these principles uh, of judicial review reflect the basic public law duties consistent with the purpose of the legislation and reasonable in the, in the Wed Wednesbury sense of judicial review. Detention. In relation to detention, applicable Home Office policy guidance, which uh, is, is the guidance that applies in relation to uh, whether uh, to ensure that detention is lawful, uh, is determined by detention and temporary release, which uh, was formerly Chapter 55. Adults at risk in immigration detention, uh, the latest version being in, on the 6th of March, and judicial reviews and injunctions, the latest version in October 2019. These policies are important because although they lack the legal status of statute, they nonetheless flesh out the bones of the legislation and provide details for the practical implementation of the legislation. They also act, importantly, as a constraint on the power to detain. So in other words, to be lawful, a detention must not only be based on one of the statutory powers and accord with the limitations implied by domestic and Strasbourg-led case law, but has to be in accordance with stated policy. And I'm just going to uh, complete my section with excerpts from policy guidance. As you can see, there's a presumption in favour of immigration bail and wherever possible, alternatives to detention are used. Detention must be used sparingly and for the shortest period necessary. This is all from chapter 55. In order to be lawful, immigration detention must be for one of the statutory purposes uh, for which the power is given and must accord with the, uh, must accord uh, with the limitations implied by domestic and European case law, European Convention case law. Uh, detention must also be in accordance with stated policy on the use of detention and can only be lawfully exercised under these provisions, whether, and this is really borrowing the words of Hardy or Singh, where there's a realistic prospect of removal within a reasonable period. Uh, and uh, when we are dealing with vulnerable people, which is important that we uh, just consider, uh, that there's an adult at risk policy. So people suffering from a condition or having experienced a traumatic event, and you can see there are examples of trafficking, torturing, torture or sexual violence, then it will be likely to render them particularly vulnerable to harm if they're detained. There are levels which start at one. One to three is based on the strength of professional medical evidence supporting the above, examples being an expert the Rule 35 report. Level one, a mere assertion by a person or their representative. Level two, evidence that may, evidence for level three, that is, and det detention is likely to cause harm. Though a stronger justification is needed to maintain detention at the higher level, for example, i.e. that strong indicators of non-compliance at second level or for level three, significant public protection concerns. And victims of torture includes torture by non-stake actors previous policy was found to be unlawful in the medical justice case in 2017 under, uh, that was uh, Mr. Justice Oosley's uh, decision, a, a, a case that you may well be familiar with. And we can talk about that in questions if necessary. So the Home Office policy in relation to judicial review and injunctions preventing removal. A pending judicial review claim without a stay or injunction does not necessarily suspend removal. But Home Office policy is that the sealed judicial review will suspend removal unless certain circumstances apply. 
either less than six months since a previous JR or appeal was concluded on the same or similar issues, or if the JR was brought by a person within a removal window until the end of that window, where removal is by special arrangement, charter flight, for example, or where a court has directed that judicial review is no bar to removal and the judicial review is not bound to fail. In other words, satisfies the low threshold, the threshold for the merits test. Um, with that, uh, that, though, that whistle stop tour, I now hand over to Pierre to deal with issues concerning immigration bail. And I shall return with him afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And um, thank you for the, um, going through the slides. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, as Tony said, I'm going to focus on the last two sections in these slides. Uh, the first being immigration bail. So I'm going to go through the statutory sections and the relevant documents that you'll need for reference purposes. And then finally, I'm going to try and draw everything all together at the end to give some practical help for you guys. We're also, we've got questions um, and answers session at the end, if there are questions. So please feel free to send in your questions on the chat. Um, equally, if you'd like to uh, also take part in the poll, that would be really helpful to us uh, to kind of understand how to improve things as we um, go on with this uh, series of webinars as a chambers. So my first uh, section being immigration bail, I'm just going to start um, with the statutory framework, which you'll find in the uh, Immigration Act 2016 uh, and the relevant place is Schedule 10. So I would um, definitely have that as the first place to, uh, to go to to check uh, on the legal position. The second very useful document in practice, which we use uh, regularly as counsel and as advocates, is the presidential guidance note for uh, first year judges. Um, and you can find that again on Google. And that has some very useful passages, uh, which uh, I'm going to come to highlight some of them. Um, you also obviously have to be familiar with the first tier tribunal procedure rules um, if you're going to be making applications. Uh, and finally, the Home Office guidance can sometimes uh, be useful because, of course, if you're in a bail hearing and the Home Office have not followed their own guidance, then obviously that gives you uh, an argument uh, to run as well. Uh, it's worth just noting that I'm sure a lot of you will have experience of uh, undertaking bail for many years. But the current system we have has only been in place uh, since the start of 2018 um, and effectively they changed everything, um, the whole framework. Um, so it's worth, if you haven't looked for a while, it's worth refreshing your memory and hopefully this talk will sort of help go some way to, to refreshing your memory about it. So starting with Schedule 10, um, and again I'd encourage you all to go and just read it, it's not that long. Um, the first section deals with Secretary of State bail. Um, and that is uh, the first point to note really is that replaced what you might have remembered as temporary admission or temporary release. So when the Home Office detains someone and then decides that they're going to release them, but not granting them any leave, it used to be called uh, temporary release. Now everything's called bail, uh, whether you get it from the Secretary of State or from the Tribunal. Uh, section 1, subsection 3 governs the first, or gives the power to the first year tribunal to grant bail. Um, and obviously these provisions all apply where the Secretary of State has used the power to detain, which um, we've seen from Tony's uh, intro that where the powers come from, uh, largely the 1971 Act. Uh, the relevant matters, which obviously are going to be important in practice, uh, now these are sort of paraphrasing what uh, Section 3 of Schedule 10 says, but they're likely to be, for example, the risk of absconding, uh, so the risk that the Home Office thinks it's gonna, someone's going to run away, the risk of reoffending, and that obviously of particular importance in uh, criminal cases where you're dealing with FNOs or foreign national offenders, uh, the risk of harm to the public, equally more likely to arise in criminal cases, um, the protection of the particular person, um, if there are safeguarding concerns, and then the statute obviously leaves open um, other matters which may or may not be relevant in the particular case. Those are the um, important go-to factors consider when you're considering arguments to make in a, a bail application. So for instance, the risk of absconding is lower because someone has an application that they're uh, waiting on a result for, and so they're likely to keep in touch with the Home Office. Equally, they're going to be living with a family, so a wife and children or a husband and children, for example, and that makes it less likely for them to abscond. So we're always looking at risk 
in bail applications. That's important to remember. Just to finish off the Schedule 10, the conditions uh, of bail uh, are all listed at four to eight. So they include things like electronic monitoring um, or a residence condition. Uh, conditional bail is dealt with at a subsection eight of section three. It's what used to be called bail in principle. So where someone can't physically be released, but a judge is satisfied that, but for that practical problem, the person would be released. And that often, or most often, comes up when you're dealing with people who have no accommodation to go to. And so in the time it takes to get the accommodation, you can get a first tier judge to say, well, I would grant bail and I will grant bail once the accommodation is sorted out, but we can't release you straight away. Um, there are also, and we're not going to go into too much detail on this, there are powers that the Secretary of State has to enable a person to meet those conditions. So with accommodation, you can apply to them um, normally in exceptional circumstances to get them to arrange accommodation for you if you don't have anywhere to go and equally that applies to travel expenses. So coming on to the next important document, the second major um, source of uh, arguments that we can run in an actual bail application, the uh, what we call the first tier tribunal bail guidance for immigration judges. Uh, again, you can find that online and just taking a few um, extracts. Um, bail is effectively described as the reasonable alternative to detention. So detention can only be authorised where there's no reasonable alternative. So all we have to show is that, yes, it is reasonable to grant someone bail. The first stage army was not deciding whether continued detention is lawful. This is what the guidance says. But bail should be granted if detention is no longer justified. So there's a sort of a slight tension What's important to note here for our purposes is that we're not running an unlawful detention claim when we're applying for bail. They're, sli they're slightly different. Um, but equally, the way that the guidance says bail should be granted if detention is no longer justified, inevitably, the first driver is considering the same factors as in an unlawful detention claim. So you're considering, and I'm going to go through the practical steps, um, which hopefully is going to be very useful. Um, and you, you'll see very quickly that we're dealing with ultimately the same arguments as you'll see in an unlawful detention claim. But what bail is, is essentially a risk assessment. Uh, and that's important. And you can remember, we, we just spoke about uh, what the considerations in a bail application will be, and a lot of them will be, to, will be to do with risks. And so dealing with those risks is ultimately what a judge is going to be concerned about in a bail application. I've got some extracts here uh, and these are sort of very useful for grounds, uh, bail grounds or for argument in a bail application. Um, the most general one is of course that liberty is a fundamental right of all people and they can only be restricted if there's no reasonable alternative uh, as we just saw. And so this principle applies to all people in the UK including those who are detained under immigration powers because they don't have the right or the leave to be here. Here's a very familiar one I'm sure a lot of you will see very often. It's generally accepted that detention for three months would be considered a substantial period and six months a long period. Imperative considerations of public safety may be necessary to justify detention in excess of six months. And so obviously where you have a client who has been detained for a long time, we can put this in our arguments to say, where is the imperative, imperative consideration of public safety justifying continued uh, detention. It's not just your normal situation where someone's just been put in detention. Paragraph 23 is useful if you're going to be reading through the guidance. I encourage you to do that because it sets out in practice how the order uh, will go, how a, a bail hearing is going to um, proceed. My advice is that uh, judges tend to deal with these differently. Some judges like to hear everything first and not say anything and then give their sort of preliminary view and invite further submissions. Other judges just take control from the start and say, this is what I think, this is what I think. Um, and then only ask you to deal with very sort of small points which are concerning them. Um, but the paragraph 23 is a useful place to go to try and understand um, the rough um, order of events. Finally, it's for the immigration authorities to show it's more likely than not that there's no reasonable alternative to detention. Now, that is a very important, obviously, because what that means is that it's for the presenting officer or the home office to justify 
detention. And although we're making the application for bail, it's important that if the bail summary is not very convincing um, or they don't address particular points, then you really put the burden on them uh, to prove that detention is justified. It's not for us to prove that detention is not justified. Now, coming back to try and understand and see the contrast with um, unlawful detention claims, as I said before, bail is primarily concerned with uh, risk. So it's a risk assessment. And these to, you constantly see the, the word safeguarding. And so what the tribunal is effectively doing is safeguarding against particular risks. Uh, compared to unlawful detention, there's, there's, you can say there's a, law, uh, a lower threshold to engage. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to, um, the, the reasonable period doesn't necessarily have to have expired before you can get bail. Um, and generally, in when you're in a bail application, you're not dealing with reasonable period as you would in a hide or sing type of challenge. You're dealing with the imminence of removal. So if removal is not happening in the next few weeks, you should be on much stronger ground in a bail application. Whereas in a, a lawful detention claim, they're going to have a sort of look overall as to whether um, it's still reasonable to detain, you know, whether or not that removal is imminent. Uh, and also, of, Coming back to the whole question of dealing with risk in a bail application, you can uh, deal with the, these risks and propose suitable conditions. Um, and we looked at a few, so for example, absconding, you can say that there's a financial condition supporter or a surety who's going to make sure that they comply. You can put them on a tag, electronic monitoring. And if you're concerned, if the judge is concerned about reoffending or, or harm, you're obviously going to have um, potentially licensed conditions that address those risks, but also you can they can put in a curfew um, and that should um, at least address the, the risk of reoffending. But as I said um, at the start, when you come to dealing with bail and unlawful detention, in practice you're going to be uh, looking at the same considerations. Uh, and the first and most important one is what is the prospect of removal? and deportation that takes us right back to the start and one of the very first things Tony saw uh, and explained when looking at the statutory powers they are framed for the purpose of removal and that's important because and that explains why uh, it's always for the Home Office to show that there is a prospect of removing them you can't just indefinitely detain somebody uh, we call these barriers so barriers to removal and they can be legal barriers. So for example, you have a pending application or a pending appeal uh, or judicial review, um, in which case you have to sort of un have an idea of the underlying merits and the timescales. Um, but there are also practical uh, barriers to removal. So for example, where someone can't get a travel document. Um, and obviously at the moment, the practical issue of not physically being able to remove someone to the particular country. Um, so that's a practical barrier to removal. And um, what's important normally is for the Home Office to uh, respond and say what actions are needed and what are the timescales. And the longer these things are going to take, the more reasonable bail is going to be um, and the less likely that removal is going to be imminent, obviously. You obviously have to then look at what the risk factors uh, are. So what reasons are the Home Office giving for opposing bail? Normally, it's going to be um, you've shown a disregard to immigration laws and we think you're going to abscond. Um, and that will be in the vast majority of removal cases. So you're particularly going to have to look at a history or allegations that someone has failed to attend or has stopped reporting or has been arrested and tried to run away. Um, these are things that you shouldn't avoid because the Home Office is going to argue them. So you have to confront them. Again, in criminal cases, reoffending and harm are going to be high up on the agenda. Uh, you also have to look at the effects on the detainee, him, uh, him or herself. So any physical or mental health issues, um, whether they're an adult at risk, according to the guidance that Tony took you through. And finally, the effect on others, so their family, their children, um, and those people will inevitably be, be affected by not having uh, the person in their lives. So those considerations are relevant, both to bail and to the unlawful detention claim um, the final section, uh, and this is going to be a bit shorter because we're running out of time. I'm just going to give you a few practical tips or carry on giving you a few, few practical tips 
um, in dealing with bail applications, particularly at the moment. So the, the first question, uh, important questions, is I'm going to go through quickly because I've just covered this effectively, is how long has this person been detained and what is the current position with regards to removal? So what are the Home Office saying? When can they remove him? Or what do they say they can remove him? We then go on to consider the barrier, as we just did. So this often will be a question of um, thinking if there isn't a claim that's pending, whether a claim can be made. So there may be a fresh claim if there's already been a refusal. There may be a claim that's never been pursued before. That should definitely be investigated. It may be that a claim has been refused, but there's a, a scope to judicially review it, um, in which case that would um, represent another barrier to removal um, following the Home Office policy guidance that Tony referred you to. Um, effectively, what you're trying to do always is look to, to give reasons why removal is not going to happen anytime soon. And so that includes practical issues we refer to, like is removal happening at the moment and can they get a travel document? Vulnerability is important. And again, risk of absconding harm or harm, which we've just spoken about. Um, thinking about the conditions that can meet those particular risks. And then finally, arranging uh, sureties, which I'm sure your, all your practitioners will be familiar with, you know, asking them for bank statements and proof of address, et cetera. And there are lots of practical difficulties with getting them to bring that. Um, one very useful thing, I should say quickly, about addresses, the bail guidance for immigration judges actually says, unless there's a reason for thinking that someone doesn't give permission, the tribunal can assume that they do. So don't be too concerned if you can't get a landlord's permission, for example, because that shouldn't necessarily itself stop bail being granted. So summarising everything that we've just spoken about very quickly, the first port of call is to look at the position in the substantive case, so what applications are happening the position on removal. You look at the previous bail applications and, and if they've been refused, you look at the reasons why, so you can try and address those. The grounds for bail in your application obviously have to be relevant and concise. There's no real benefit in having a very lengthy sort of template that you apply in all your cl clients' cases, because these will, be quite, uh, these will be different in practice. And really the tribunal wants to understand very quickly what the concerns are here. Uh, the practical steps if you want to apply to the Home Office is to use the uh, Bail 401 form. It's just a seven page form that you need to fill in. And the first tier tribunal application form is B1. Uh, and currently they are still taking bail applications. Um, so um, not, things haven't stopped. Obviously they're being heard remotely, um, but you can still apply for first tier tribunal bail and Home Office bail. You then need to prepare other relevant documents. So. It may be that your client has medical concerns or a family member has that you need to get hold of to show the judge. And you may need also to show, for example, um, a court notice to say there's a, a hearing that's coming up or a judicial review uh, form, a sealed form, so you can show that there's been a lodged uh, application in the upper tribunal or the high court. Uh, and then obviously you deal with the surety documents and address documents. Now, finally, we thought we we're going to look in during the pandemic. As I said, they, they continue to be listing hearings remotely. There's been very high granting rates. So BID, uh, Bail for Immigration Detainees, the, the charity reported that since March, 95% of their uh, applications were granted out of 55 hearings. There has been a letter issued, a public letter issued by the Home Office, sort of criticising judges for granting bail so, so readily. Uh, and the president of the First Tribunal came back and responded. Um, in quite strong terms saying, well, we just apply the law. Um, so really what you should be advising any client that you have in detention at the moment is uh, consider applying for bail. Obviously you can consider an unlawful detention claim, um, but uh, these cases are going to likely to be uh, criminal cases at the moment because it seems that the vast majority of people still detained, so four to 500 people are all criminal cases. So the idea, being in those cases, you're really going to have to address the idea of risk. And that includes uh, challenging any assessments that maybe the Home Office is relying on. So maybe you can get an updated assessment from probation if, you're, if it's not a high risk, or you can potentially instruct somebody uh, like a forensic psychologist to issue a report saying this assessment isn't necessarily correct. And finally, and I, I regret we're not going to have that much time to go into this, um, there have been some unlawful detention claims during the pandemic. The most, uh, there are two in fact. The first one was heard in late March in, by the High Court 
um, by, it was brought by detention action. It was a class claim trying to get the release of everybody and the uh, High Court uh, refused that application. And um, basically, as Tony said, they were satisfied that the Home Office had put in appropriate measures so that detention wasn't unlawful in all cases. But that was, bear in mind, that was uh, a couple of months ago now. And so given the time that's passed and not much seems to have changed on the removals front, you'd likely, it's likely that you're going to get a, a, a more favourable outcome uh, now than, than at that point. And there has been another case called Stephen Bellow, uh, which um, it hasn't been reported yet, but that was a, a successful claim. So, um, and that was at the end of April. So if you're looking now, then you would think if nothing's changed in your client's case, the longer things go on, the more likely that someone is going to be eligible for release. And if not, can make an unlawful detention claim. Those are, that was the kind of, uh, the, the main areas where we wanted to focus on in, in what's quite a short talk. You will have these slides up on our website so you can refer back to them. Um, and at this point, we wanted to consider uh, some questions uh, potentially, um, and we have a couple. So I'm gonna to invite Tony back in. And um, the first question, is if a person has been uh, released, what's the best way of pursuing damages? Shall I deal with that, Pierre? Please, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, the answer is, um, obviously it's a potentially a civil claim that you'll be bringing for a claim for damages in, in, as for unlawful detention. So uh, the best way for the person who's been released is to contact a solicitor to say, I'm, I'm seeking to uh, argue a false imprisonment, um, uh, uh, excessive detention claim. Uh, and to get the solicitor to uh, be instructed to pursue a civil claim. Um, generally, certainly um, it, within, uh, within civil claims uh, for unlawful detention, you will normally be eligible for legal aid. So you, provided there was a basis for um, a, a good claim on the face of it, and such a person would be if they were um, hopefully uh, had been detained for a long period, longish period, will certainly get the advice. And if it appeals, appears that the, on the face of it, there's, there could be a proper hardy or sing claim, uh, that would be the first start. And then uh, you proceed with a civil claim in the usual way. Um, I think the second question, Pierre, is geared towards you, I think. Oh, uh, well, shall I read it out? So during the pandemic, is there any sort of presumption or starting point that detention is likely to be unlawful and or bail should be granted? Again, it comes back to, uh, I think, it comes back to the main principles that we spoke about because at the very heart, the power to detain is premised upon being able, the Home Office being able to remove someone or deport them. The fact that they can't presently remove someone is obviously going to be very important. So I don't know if you can describe it as a presumption. I would certainly uh, feel that there's a very strong chance you're going to get bail in the current position where someone physically can't be removed and the Home Office isn't um, saying that we can remove them. And just a very quick side point, you know, I've seen bail applications recently, bail summaries, where the Home Office haven't even mentioned uh, COVID uh, or the pandemic or anything to do with that. They've just used the old bail summary. So um, the Home Office isn't necessarily responding very quickly um, and we should take advantage of that. And I think Perhaps calling it a presumption um, is a bit much, but it certainly gives us a very strong argument. I mean, that's how I'd answer that question. Um, thanks, Pierre. Uh, the third question, I, I will say something. I'm a little bit conscious not to say anything too much because, as you probably know, I, I sit as a part-time judge and I have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but probably my reticence to answer the question probably answers your question anyway. But perhaps I can ask Pierre to deal with that more directly. It did seem... Um, in general terms, I'll say this as a general observation, um, one expects uh, the, uh, the judges involved in relation to bail applications to do their job properly and appropriately and not to uh, and do that independently and not to have interference uh, from uh, the Home Office in that regard. So I think I've sort of answered the question, but perhaps Pierre can finish it. Well, it was, I mean, I don't I suppose you can call it controversial, but I guess it's controversial to people who are immigration law nerds. Um, but I mean, I think it was an appropriate response, if you ask me, because it's not appropriate for the Home Office uh, to go out and uh, make a public sort of criticism of judges who are applying the law in individual cases. 
And uh, unless they're asserting that the judges are sort of biased, which obviously they're not, they shouldn't really have been releasing uh, any sort of public letters like that, I think. And I, I, and I support the president, the first tribunal in the response, which was effectively, we're just applying the law, um, you know. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful, Pierre. Um, I think the, the next question from Pooja Verma is, is definitely a bail question. So um, do you want to deal with that one? It's up to the home. Yeah, so it's a, it's a quite a complicated question in practice. Um, because often you have repeated applications for bail in principle because they're only given for weeks. Now, I think the, uh, what, what Pooja is suggesting is probably the most sensible thing to do, which is to get into the, uh, to contact the, the first day tribunal so it goes before a judge. And if it can be varied, um, then fine. And if one, then Potentially, the Home Office won't oppose if it's already been granted in principle a few weeks earlier. My experience is that they often do still oppose them, so you may have to go back and apply again. So potentially try to see how what movement there is on the accommodation front uh, and then maybe consider reapplying for bail in principle. If you need the bail in principle to get the accommodation, then obviously do that. If you don't, if you can get things moving with um, probation or police, then uh, go ahead and do that and then potentially reapply for bail when you, it doesn't have to be bail in principle. But a previous grant of bail in principle is always going to be helpful when you come back before another judge. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think, Pierre, the, the next question is again, I think a bail directed question, um, but um, maybe just want to say a word also about uh, what will happen, the, the connection between uh, Brexit and the European Convention because obviously uh, one doesn't follow or flow from the other so I mean in general terms um, the European Convention is still part of our law as and until it is no longer part of our law and uh, there has been a lot of controversy about it but I, I, I don't anticipate that we're going to be uh, any any short any any reasonably short uh, short period going to be contracting out of the European Convention uh, if the government were thinking about it I think there would be very strong resistance certainly from the leader of the opposition who I think was very much involved in the drafting of it. I agree. Or drafting, <laughs> drafting our involvement joining it. Important to understand that the European Convention on Human Rights is not um, we're not um, leaving the European Convention, it's separate from the EU. Uh, in fact, the European Convention of Human Rights, even though we're signatories to it, um, it it's not, doesn't have direct effect in UK law. So most of our principles uh, relying on those rights actually come from the domestic case law. Um, so they're just normal domestic law. Uh, we're not relying on that often. We don't rely on um, Strasbourg authorities because the same principles are found in domestic jurisprudence and um, so they will continue to be applicable in um, bail applications and unlawful detention claims um, but because they form part of our domestic law now. Yes thank you. Uh, I think there was another Q&A again I think it's a bail directed question Pierre. Uh, I think we're coming towards the end of the questions but um, do you want to deal with that one? Uh, well, the, the one I've got from Juba Ahmed is, when applying for bail, would you advise to apply directly to first tier or SSHD? Because uh, they're quite slow and reluctant. That's probably quite a, a useful question. You don't have to apply for bail first from the Home Office. Um, your, the, the first tier driving is going to consider any application that's made from someone who's been detained. And they won't normally even mention a Home Office bail application. Um, if the Home Office is slow, then I would encourage you to go to the first tier tribunal because they list them quite quickly. So often you can get a listing within a week. Um, and if there are delays with the uh, home office, then you can get uh, an outcome much quicker. Um, but it's worth making the application because there's nothing to lose. Um, and also it gives you an idea of what arguments the home office is, is using to oppose you. Thank you. Um, and I, I think there's also been one question. It's not, it's not on the Q&A, but I think it's under the chat that I think I promised on your behalf, Pierre, that you'd also answer. So do you want to just check that on the chat? What changes do you reckon with leaving the EU will happen in the impact of bail and immigration? Is that the one? Yeah. 
Well, as we, I mean, we just said that um, it doesn't affect bail arguments. It doesn't affect the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, it's obviously going to affect those people who are um, here under EU law. So as soon as EU law ceases to apply, those people will no longer have the right to be here. So they have an alternative. They have to make an alternative application. And at the moment, that's under the EU settlement scheme. So provided nothing changes, at, at the moment, we're on course to leave the EU or we're on course for these laws to, to change over uh, in December, so at the end of the year. And um, it's difficult to gauge the sort of general impact on uh, immigration. Uh, so the numbers, for example, I know the BBC uh, today or yesterday published uh, the latest statistics on the numbers of people coming, um, whether it's going to affect that. I would say just in general, in terms of from a practitioner's perspective, it just takes away uh, strong arguments that we could have made for people to stay here on EU law so that that no longer exists. There is, however, the EU settlement scheme where most, if not all of the rights of residence are transferred over into um, immigration rule form. So you can make an application. How that's going to work in practice in terms of if they say no and you have to appeal uh, we think that there's going to be appeal rights uh, but again these things are probably low down on the list of priorities of a government who not least it not has to deal with the current crisis but also hasn't even negotiated the um, economic agreement so there are obviously going to be impacts but quite where we are still we don't really know and uh, so we're going to have to keep looking uh, and uh, reacting as we as, as we can Thank you, Pierre. Um, I think we've over a little bit. I know that there probably are quest further questions to be answered. Can I suggest that if anybody wants to ask any further questions, they can contact us by email. We'll be delighted to answer any further questions. I am slightly conscious we've slightly overrun, 